started. Uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, joining another edition of CPT Developer Program Dev Chat. The, those of you who are new for this, uh, Dev Chats are a regular touch point for you all to hear what's going on uh, with uh, with our developer program. Also for us to hear out what's going on with you. And uh, also we li always like to invite speakers who are unique in their roles, who can give this group a perspective on innovative activities in healthcare. And we have an exciting lineup today. More on that to come. Uh, just quickly, I am Sandeep Jamale. I'm uh, uh, the Director of Engineering for Health Solutions, who is managing the AMA Intelligent Platform and CPT developer program. Uh, and uh, uh, two ground rules uh, as we get started. Uh, uh, add questions in QA anytime. Uh, raise your hand and unmute yourself when, uh, when you need to speak. Uh, this session is being recorded and will be available on AMA Intelligent Platform through which you access our CPD developer program. Uh, and we discuss about a lot of features, but we don't. Uh, there are no definitive feature timelines unless explicitly stated in this presentation. Uh, with that being said, I'm really excited with the lineup we have, and I'm going to hand it over to Dennis. Right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. Dennis Kazwan um, on the product team here at AMA, uh, focused around CPT. Um, so today, uh, we'll go through just some quick uh, dev program updates, uh, give you a snapshot of what the program looks like and, and a couple of things to come. Um, we'll get into our guest speaker, uh, Sally Ann Frank from Microsoft, and then uh, we'll hear from you, uh, talk about your use cases, any questions and, and concerns coming up. Um, and we have some uh, you know, specific topics around that that we can uh, explore. So let's go on to the program updates. Um, when uh, we look at how the program is structured, the, the licensees that we have, uh, you know, one of the key parts of the dev program is um, royalty-free use of the CPT code set. Um, and we ask you know, what, what the use cases are of the participants. And, uh, and they tell us, we've, we've kind of grouped them into these, um, these somewhat arbitrary buckets, but uh, they are uh, helpful for us to, to see you know, what you're working on and, and what we should be talking about. Um, and not surprisingly, the, the majority of people are working on things that have to do with billing and claims, um, you know, improving the process, taking a new spin on it, taking an old spin on it in, in a new way. Um, and so that's really uh, helpful to see. A lot of people are trying to improve how information is communicated uh, to end users, clinicians and, and, uh, and coders and the like. Um, we have uh, a fair amount of people running different types of analytics solutions. Uh, so that's, uh, that's always interesting to see. That one is, is definitely um, emerging. It's catching up to some of the others. Uh, there are a lot of people who are still exploring, and that is, is great to see, too. Uh, we want to encourage um, you know, people to, to get in and uh, see what they might be able to do. Um, it, we don't need people to, to really have a firm understanding of how they'll incorporate CPT or operate in healthcare um, as they participate in this program. Uh, and so we're, we're happy to see um, a sizable chunk of people uh, still trying to figure out what they're working on. Um, and then EMRs and price transparency uh, are, are also uh, interesting. Uh, EMRs, you would think that uh, you know not a lot of people are trying to build new EMRs with the, the big players, but uh, there really is a, a need for some, uh, some very specific uh, EMR functionality in, in areas of medicine. So, um, so that's exciting to see. Um, overall, the program has over 2,300 uh, participants. Um, so we'd love to see the, um, the participation here. Uh, you know, the program isn't that old. And so uh, the more uh, feedback that we can get about how people need to learn about CPT and, and other AMA uh, initiatives, uh, the better that we can uh, evolve this program. Uh, and part of that, um, like I said, the, the dev licenses, uh, we have over 300 uh, licenses there. So uh, that's a lot of people using CPT in new innovative ways. Uh, again, wonderful to see. Uh, okay, when um, uh, we talk about the, the program and what's in it, um, you know, the dev 
program uh, site on the AMA Intelligent platform as kind of the home base for where to explore these resources. Uh, we have a page going live uh, tomorrow uh, that uh, expands the view into all the resources that, that the AMA um, does provide. Uh, you know, we're a not-for-profit organization, and so a lot of what we do um, is, is mission-based and, and trying to make um, improvements in the industry. And so there are a lot of different resources that, um, that you can leverage around um, you know, understanding an industry perspective on AI and health equity, um, you know, ways to, to improve um, practice um, operation. Um, and that may not be specifically technology oriented on the face of it, um, but understanding the, the challenges that clinicians have and how they can improve their workflows um, gives uh, solution creators um, you know, ideas for how to, uh, how to build their, uh, their products going forward. Uh, so this um, this area of the uh, dev program, uh, like I said, will be up tomorrow. Um, lots more um, uh, interaction to, to be had. Um, and we keep uh, looking forward to uh, expanding our, our uh, technology footprint. So always open to hear uh, feedback and, and requests uh, on that side. Um, could I have uh, the poll number one, please? So we'll uh, run a couple of quick polls just to gauge the audience a little bit, um, you know, understanding you know, kind of how um, how you interact with the program, um, kind of what you're working on, um, just to help frame you know, the conversation um, where it goes from here. Yeah, take a moment to answer those questions. And if you have not signed up for CTD the dev program, definitely do so. Yeah. So this question is really just about, uh, you know, how do you participate in the dev program? Are you in the program, a licensee? Um, are you not uh, a, a dev licensee, but a, a production licensee? Um, none of the above. Well, if we end it there, okay, so um, we've got, um, let's see, 20% are signed up for the program and um, a production licensee, uh, half of you are signed up for the program and uh, have a dev license, um, and then 30% um, don't have a CPT license um, or signed up uh, at all. That's Good to know. Okay. And then um, we run poll number two, please. Okay. And the question here is just are you building a new solution or product? And the great part is even if you're any part of this journey, across the, all the options. There are lots of resources in the GAP program that are packaged that Dennis was walking into. Uh, as you answer the question, I thought at least I'll cover uh, the breadth of the resources. Then even when you're not started, you still can learn about uh, how CBD works and how the ecosystem that works uh, and the resources that you have for it. Okay, pretty even split uh, right across the board. Um, just here to listen, um, just getting started. Uh, and well underway. So uh, nobody is is just in that kind of thinking about it stage. Okay, so good deal. Um, all right, so I say overall the um, it's it's people that are actually um, working on it. All right, with that, um, you know, next up, I'm uh, very excited to welcome Sally and Frank to the Dev Chat. Uh, Sally is the um, Health and Life Sciences uh, Worldwide Lead for Microsoft for Startups. Uh, she just released a book titled The Startup Protocol, A Guide for Digital Health Startups. Uh, and so her insight and connections um, from a, a very productive career uh, really come through uh, in that book and, and in the work that she does. And so uh, we have uh, an outstanding benefit of hearing her part of, of um, that experience uh, firsthand uh, today. 
Uh, she definitely blends the technical and business side of things. Uh, she has a master's in systems management uh, and an MBA. Uh, and she spent over 25 years in the tech industry, uh, multiple roles working uh, directly with startups. Um, so, so definitely a fantastic resource uh, for us today. Uh, she'll be talking about uh, the challenges of innovating in healthcare. And um, with that, let's, let's get to it. Uh, welcome, Sally. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And um, uh, let me see if I can, I can go ahead and share my screen. Yes, please. Okay, let's see if I can do this. Share screen. Did I do it right? That looks good. Okay, great. Well, thank you for um, that lovely introduction, first of all, and uh, for inviting me to participate um, in the call today. I'm always very excited to talk with folks that are actively engaged in the process of innovating in a, in a meaningful way. I'm trying to figure out um, this interface. I am not good at Zoom. So um, let me see if I can work this a little bit better. Um, Give me one moment, please. Okay, there we go. That's what I needed. All right, so you can see my screen, correct? Um, yes, all right. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit, as, as Dennis said, a little bit about kind of the um, uh, challenges and some of the industry trends that we're seeing. You folks live and work in them every day, just like I do, but sometimes it's interesting to call out some that are a little bit under the covers, maybe not so evident. Um, and then I'll tell you a little bit about Microsoft for Startups, but keep in mind that as I go through this, you know, I, I would love for you to chime in with comments or questions. And also I'm gonna try and share with you the journey of one particular startup that I think will resonate with you um, as we go through this. So first, some of the trends that we're looking at and some of the things that we're all experiencing. Um, we've all seen a decline since the, the boon year of, of 2021 and uh, to a lesser extent, 2022. 2023 wasn't so great. But one of the things that I think is important to remember when we talk about innovation and funding is that when money is hard to get, it's actually a good thing because it requires more due diligence from the innovators and from those funding them um, in a way that when money is easy, it doesn't require. And so it forces us as an ecosystem to really think about what we're doing, where the value is, and if we are providing something that people are willing to pay to solve. So I, I know that everyone goes, oh, it's so sad. We're not, we don't have all the money that we used to, but it's, it's, I would say it's an opportunity to do better um, than we might have been doing previously. I will say, uh, you know, as far as funding goes, in 21 and 22, we saw a huge influx for health and life sciences. I think that momentum has all been, you know, moved to Gen AI, probably. It's probably safe to say that that's where the money is now. Um, and if you can build Gen AI into healthcare, then you have a better chance of getting some decent funding. Um, so the other thing I wanted to, to mention is in addition to a lot of these um, trends around, you know, investments and what's happening on that side. There's been a few interesting studies about the other side of the coin, where the providers are feeling um, better about what's happening. And so there was a recent study by Atomic Research, and that's with a, Atomic with a K at the end, that was funded by Ernst & Young. And they interviewed um, uh, several thousand healthcare executives about their desire to innovate and their desire to um, look at Gen AI and some of these other AI uh, technologies. And one of the things that came up, there were two findings that I thought were really interesting. One was 96% said that they think new technology, new AI can help them do their jobs better. However, 71% said in the initiatives that they've already kicked off, 
71% said we've not seen any cost reduction. So no real ROI. So they believe it, they're believers, like they get it, but they're not seeing the return on investment that they had hoped. So I think that's a good lesson for all of us to think about is, are we doing something that not only helps, but is there a direct line to either revenue generation through more patients, better care, you know, um, some of the ancillary so services that have a greater margin, or are we helping them reduce costs? And so another really good data point, I thought, because it was so surprising to me that there was such an overwhelming majority, 96% said, yes, we want to do this and we think it's good. And 71% saying, yeah, but we're not seeing the return. So good thing to remember. Um, a couple of areas that I want to point out that are uh, ripe for um, innovation and funding. Uh, we're seeing a lot in care delivery and navigation. We're seeing a lot when we think about Gen AI primarily on the administrative side and how do we shorten workflows, how do we do the pre-authorizations, the, the summaries, and, and all of those things. Um, so a couple of more kind of trendy things. Um, this first thing on the right from, and I have a big screen behind my little screen that has the the uh, that has the the deck on it, so that's why I'm looking up. But um, the six areas of digital health growth um, are there from CB Insights, and I think if you've been around this ecosystem recently over the last couple of years, you've seen that mental health is a real growth area, telehealth, uh, virtual wellness. Um, you know, chronic care, all of those areas, and actually the meshing of those into single solutions or single platforms is also taking uh, a bit of a growth spurt. On the left side from Frost and Sullivan, we see those areas where um, profits are, which is really interesting because you want to think about where they can purchase, where they have the budget to purchase what you're building. So those are some of the areas that are looking to be very uh, growth centric. I, I really was pleased to see not only generative AI to improve the clinician experience, which I think we've had you know drilled into our heads multiple times um, throughout the last year or so, but also looking at like geographic expansion into the Middle East and the convergence as we we're just talking about with chronic care, uh, digital therapeutics, RPM for extended virtual care. So I'm gonna stop here. Well, no, I've got one more. Um, so these trends I think are uh, more about my kind of distillation of everything that I'm reading. So, um, you know, we're all seeing the, um, the great resignation, which I think is, kind of trickled to some extent, it's not the same level. But one of the things that is true is that we have an uptick in people going to medical school and nursing school, which is great, but there are two issues there. One is that they're not graduating fast enough to fill the gaps that's being left by people leaving the industry. And number two is most of them are digital natives and are going to expect more from our healthcare systems and our healthcare technology. So, you know, for, for me, who was not a digital native, I'm, I'm on the boomer side, you know, I've evolved with the technology and I, rem, you know, I go to my doctor's office and I'm basically going through the same workflow I've gone through for my whole life. But for those that are under 30, and for the majority of adults over 30, many of them, I think it's under 30, it's more like 60%, do not have primary care physicians. They are looking to go to urgent cares, minute clinics. They just don't care when they're sick. They want the care and they want it as conveniently as possible, as quick as possible, and they want it right around the corner from them. So when we think about the, the healthcare system, we need to think about how not only patients are evolving and their expectations are evolving, but the people coming into healthcare and what their expectations are and, and having single sign-on and not having all these different systems. I think that's, but yet having the ability to be very tech savvy in the work that they do. Um, yeah, so we talked about time, access and convenience. 
uh, retail and urgent uh, care settings. So the, the two final things on this slide, I think are very much connected. When I talk about point solution fatigue, that is the fact that the EMRs are where we live and breathe and work. And anything, any solution that requires a practitioner to go out of that EMR, do another sign on, look at a different portal, different dashboard, you know, data that may not be up to date or may be more up to date than what's in the, in the EMR, that all causes a tremendous amount of issues. And it's going to really slow down adoption and might make your solution not adopted at all. So what's important is to really align the product, regulatory, and go-to-market roadmaps. And what do I mean by that? I mean that as you're building your um, product roadmap, you want to look at the regulatory aspects. Is your solution going to have to go through 510K, CE mark, whatever it may be? And if so, what does that take? And in addition to the regulatory side, we also have the integration aspects. And I, I see those two things as kind of together because it all revo revolves around um, things like HIPAA and um, high trust, as well as how the data is surfaced and where it's surfaced and how it's secured and how the patient data is managed, the PHI and the PII. So all of that kind of falls onto that regulatory scope and then the final part is the go-to-market roadmap. So if you think in terms of, can you bring your solution through some court, some type of trial, an IRB, a clinical trial, while you're building that go-to-market roadmap, while you have your regulatory process begun, and while you are looking for you know, V1.5 or v V2 of your solution, so that all of that is culminating into a cohesive business that will be successful. I'll tell you a story um, about one particular startup in our portfolio. It's a company called Vast Minds. And they did something really, really interesting that I had not seen before. And I think it's worthy of note. They have a solution that is an app that you log on to, you open it on your on your phone, and it gives you your biometrics through the um, through your cell or webcam phone um, camera. And the idea here is that it gives O2 saturation, pulse, blood pressure, heart rate, and stress level. Now there are a few of these in the market. I'm not going to say they're only one. They're the only one because I don't believe in unique solutions. There's always four people trying to solve the same problem, if not 400. But I do think their solution is quite good. And they ended up um, starting their regulatory process, but they wanted to generate revenue as early as possible. So they sold their solution to insurers, to airlines, to a bunch of other non-healthcare organizations as a wellness tool. And they have been tremendously successful in doing that. And so I thought it was really an interesting way of looking at, yes, we do have, a, we understand our regulatory path. We realize it's gonna take a while. So we're gonna build this tool and make sure that there are other ways of using it that are more aligned to, hey, do we want this pilot to fly if he's super stressed? Or um, is this person who's applying for insurance really a good risk, which uh, it's a little bit wonky there. Um, to think about just uh, metrics, but it's it's happening. And the other thing I'll say before I, I get off of this particular story is that um, Vast Minds, their solution works on all skin type, does not do facial recognition. They went through an ethical AI review um, and they passed with flying colors. So it actually works on looking at the blood flow under the skin and it can work on all skin types. So anyway, the moral of the story is while you're waiting for your regulatory path, are there other ways to ethically generate revenue and find customers? Really interesting story. All right, so I wanna stop here and open it up and see if there are any questions or comments, and then I'll go through uh, kind of the journey of one of our startups 
uh, through our program. I'll jump right in. Um, <laughs> anybody else uh, is welcome to, to join as well. Um, the uh, your stat about 71% of uh, the adopters not seeing the cost benefits right off the bat. Do you feel like um, there is less patience with solutions now? Like the buyers want to see results in real time? So I'm, I'm, there was no time horizon on, on that particular survey. Um, my own experience is that there's a little bit more patience than I would expect, but at the same time, especially in the provider space, there's so much pressure um, and, and with few exceptions, a lot of them are operating in the red. Um, as we all know. And so, you know, when Mayo says uh, that they posted a 6%, you know, um, profit, you're going 6%. Wow, that's great. So so I think that there's, I think it, it really depends on the stage of the startup. So if a provider is working with an early stage company and they're doing some co-development and they have maybe not a cheap product market fit, but the startup is bringing an MVP that is going to be evolving and and maybe improving based on how the provider works with them. I think the patience is there, but if you come as a product market fit startup and you've got demonstrable customer traction, they're expecting to see ROI probably faster. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, Phil, I saw a question from you um, about which EMR do you recommend? Do you want to expand on that? The question? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Sally. Uh, Phil, do you want to expand on that or? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Can, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, you, you mentioned uh, earlier about um, doctors liking to look at just a single EMR system. They don't want to go to different portals. Uh, what kind of EMR system are you talking about? Yes, yeah, so that would be Epic or Cerner or Athena Health. Um, what's the other one? Meta, Meta. Metatech. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> and brain freeze. Yeah. So, so those are the big ones in the industry, and and the fact of the matter is that it's really incumbent upon you to look at your targets, especially um, target customers, especially early on and determine are they Epic customers, are they Cerner customers, and start with the integration there with the ones that are, that you're gonna go after because you it's a, it's a, um, it's a bit of a, it's not easy, shall we say. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so um, making sure that you're going where your customers are is gonna be key to, to success in the early stages. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Gilbert, uh, and then I, saw, I see a hand raised. Um, so what are your views concerning the use of Tefka and QHINs uh, for fixing integration issues? Or say it again? Uh, for fixing integration issues? No, but before that, I'm sorry, you cut oh, out for me. Sorry, uh, Tefka and QHINs. Yeah, so I'm familiar with Tefka. I'm not sure, I'm not familiar with the other one, but absolutely. Yes. Application of Tefka. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, I've seen, I, I, I actually was reading about that the other day, but um, yeah, I mean, I think any way that you can um, zero in on and take advantage of the industry specific guidelines and, um, you know, we've got several organizations that are now coming together to talk about how we apply AI responsibly, ethically, equitably in healthcare. And so um, uh, any, I think it's incredibly important to either get involved in those um, activities or to follow them and make sure that you are staying up to date because that's where the that's where when you go to your customer and you go, hey, we are compliant with X, Y, and Z, or we're part of this consortium, or we've been following this regulation, that's where they're going to go, okay, I feel better now. Low, risk is now lower. 
we were just uh, speaking with um, uh, one of the big EMRs and they were pointing out that the, the regulations are good for establishing that kind of base level connectivity. Um, but right. really, you got to look at how your solution fits in the workflow, just like you were saying, like, does this actually, uh, you know, enable a clinician to do more instead of taking them, you know, even if it's within the EMR, is it outside their workflow? Um, and so the interoperability part should feel like it's it's not interoperability. It's just part of the workflow. Exactly. And and it should all be as as seamless as possible. Um, but yeah, you make some really excellent points and I totally agree. Uh, Justin. Hello. Yes. Um, you mentioned, you mentioned, uh, you know, the logging in and logging out of the different, of the different systems and things of that nature. Um, what do you see that could actually, I mean, actually, first of all, let me rephrase that. Um, as far as, when they're logging in and logging out of the different systems, are they using like email and passwords or, you know, are they using some different or some other type of uh, login credentials to be able to access? Or, or is, what do you think as far as like, you know, uh, a more efficient way of being able to do so? If there was a more efficient way of do, doing so, would that be beneficial? Uh, you know, as far as assisting in the process. Yeah. So, so Justin, let me try and and answer your your question with a um, with an example. And if this doesn't answer your question, then please let me know. So, one of the other startups in our program is a company called Pangea Data, and what they do is they use AI and clinical guidelines to find to go into the EMR and find misdiagnosed, underdiagnosed, or miscoded patients so that they can get better care and be um, connected to clinical trials that are suitable for them. And so right now, their solution is a separate portal. So they literally, you know, the, the, they've worked with NHS, they've worked with a variety of other um, pharmaceutical companies and, and providers. And so right now it's a separate system that they literally have to like bring up a browser, log in and um, get the information that they need, get back to the EMR and make those connections on treatment. Now they've been wildly successful even though it's a separate portal, but right now their number one priority is to make that seamless into Epic. So imagine that you're um, a practitioner, you're in your EMR, you see, you know, the, the um, electronic medical record for, uh, for Carrie here, and there's now a tab that says Pangea data, and you click on that, and it says, here are all the things that uh, Carrie was, was missed on Carrie, and here are some clinical trials that might be suitable for her. Does that, does that kind of answer your question in kind of an illustrative way? Yes, so somewhat actually, uh, and I was going to actually kind of piggyback off what you just said, basically. So misdiagnosed, misdiagnosed patients, you know, and things of that nature. I mean, that's all. I mean, when, when a doctor examines a patient or, you know, uh, sees a patient and basically, you know, administers like, you know, the subjective or the objective, the assessment, the plan of the patient, uh, I mean, how are you going to actually, and I know you kind of hit on it, but how are you going to actually go back and find that that patient was actually misdiagnosed because it's all opinion based from the actual, the, the doctor itself. So that was what the doctor basically is basically telling the patient or basically, you know, prescribe, you know, or actually the procedure that was actually done to the patient. That's what the doctor felt suit that needed to be done to the patient at that particular time. Yeah, so, so, yeah, I'm sorry, Justin, go ahead. No, 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 I'm finished. Okay, so I'll give you an example. Um, one of their uh, big customer stories is with the NHS where they were able to identify six times more patients with cachexia, which is an atrophying of the muscles when you are struggling with cancer and cancer treatments. And so, uh, it on, 
often goes unnoticed and undiagnosed. And so they had this particular uh, NHS trust go through and do their normal trying to literally manually look through patient records. And then they ran the uh, Pangea Data AI model and came up with six times more patients. So, so that's the kind of scenario. Yes, the, the patient relationship with a doctor and, and all of that and the way that things are, you know, uh, conditions are diagnosed absolutely or done subjectively to some extent. But in this case, what they're looking for are things that are missed because you have a human looking through a long, arduous, you know, messy uh, electronic medical record that was never designed for that purpose. Mm. Interesting. Okay. Another um, comment that you made really stood out to me uh, around the data in the app may be more current than what's in the EMR itself. Um, and so that's, um, that's a whole new level of complexity <laughs> when you're trying right. to sell into an EMR saying, well, our data is better than yours. Um, so it's, lots of it's just, to yeah, it's just, um, it's, it's different because we all know that EMRs were built as billing systems and now they are the repository for everything and they don't do that well. Uh, I have one question that was upon Justin's question, actually, uh, in the physician identity space, if you have any insights that you can share, that would be great. What I mean by that is instead of, and, and maybe the current on solution is to integrate with Epic and Cerner and whatever the big EMR spaces are there. But are you seeing any trends where centralized identity is taking space, maybe within Microsoft Sphere, like where physician's identity is high built in a separate place where then you don't have to log into basically Microsoft. I'm just thinking about trends in the future. Then. Yeah, I actually have not seen that. Um, doesn't mean it doesn't exist and it doesn't mean that we're not working on it, but, but I myself have not seen that. It's really an interesting concept. Yeah, great. No, I just was thinking about it. That might yeah, yeah. An idea for a start. qualify <laughs> that Sandeep is, is actually uh, an AI model that we have. <laughs> His voice <laughs> is a little max headroomy there. <laughs> Hey, hey, Sally, and I'll just chime in here before we wrap up this discussion. Good to see you. Congratulations on the book, and we're thrilled Thank to you. have you with us. Always so much insight whenever I hear you speak. I'm curious what insights you have for the audience today on kind of this idea of evidence generation. As you know, Sally, the evidence you need for FDA clearance may be different than the evidence you need for deal flow with the healthcare system, which may be different than the evidence you need with a payer, and it can be overwhelming in terms of understanding where do not only which evidence do I go after first building kind of a repository of, but then, you know, how do you do that, for instance, without FDA clearance? It's a bit of a chicken and an egg. So any advice you have in that area, I think would be helpful. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it you no know, one's, no one said healthcare was easy. Um, and, and I think it, it comes down to um, what's going to drive uh, your business goals quickest. And you can't do it all. And if the regulatory, you know, the real world evidence uh, for your regulatory approval is going to drive sales, then that's the way that's the way you go first. And so I, I think it's a question of and this goes back to, you know, aligning the product roadmap and the regulatory roadmap and the go to market roadmap. You've got to understand the relationship between those three. And if you are building something that needs to go through a particular regulatory pathway, and that affects your go, go to market, then the evidence that you need for that should be the subject of all of your early, you know, proof of concepts and pilot projects, right? If you're looking, if if your if your end customer is a payer and it's a clinical, you know, it, it's it's not clinical diagnostics, but it's more of a support tool or a revenue cycle management tool or something like that that doesn't need that kind of regulatory approval. Then you build the real world evidence for the payer. You know, it's it's all very much dependent on the business model that you're building. Start where you need to generate the revenue first. Follow that pathway because as a startup, you're not going to be able to do all three at the same time. Very helpful. Thank you, Sally. Thanks. All right. Anything else? Any other questions, Dennis? 
Um, one quick comment. It, it does seem like uh, companies tend to start with the more clinical focus and then they turn into kind of a wellness and you know, more consumer focused um, product. Um, but that, that it may also go in the reverse where the, the consumer focus gets more data that can then inform the, the more um, clinically relevant uh, startups. So yeah, that, that's a that's a really, really good point. And I've seen, um, you know, folks do it that way. The problem um, and it's not really a problem, but but some of the things that you have to tackle is that when you're selling direct to consumer, you have to sell hundreds of thousands of millions of times. So I often say, if it's possible, partner with a provider, let them help you connect with the end user, in this case, the consumer patient, so that you're doing one big partnership that then leads to a bunch of transactions because it's a very, very, I mean, you go to your app store and it's just, you know, millions and millions and millions and you go weight loss app and there are 40 million of them. So yep. yeah, it's really, it's really seems hard. It's easy, right? Just what? put it on the app store. It seems easy. Yeah, right. That's the app store yeah. and you're much Build it and they will come. Um, yeah. But I do think that there's val validity in that, but I would also say, you know, partnering with someone that can help you get there is, is going to be easier, I think, in the long run. Great. Uh, Phil, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, just one one last one is, have you, um, have you seen any startups related to value-based care? Yes. Hmm. Okay, and uh, how do they work? Can you give an example? Value-based care. I was just looking at one the other day. Um, so can you be more specific on your question? What do you mean, how do they work? Um, more like kind of, I guess, measuring value-based care and uh, providing real-world evidence and real-world data. Yes, uh, I guess. I that there are a lot that to try to tackle like a sliver, like are they trying to tackle care coordination or the contracting? And yeah. you know, so there are multiple different parts of it. Um, I guess that, that I was thinking of that when I asked about the patient's aspect, because it does seem like value-based care is taking a long time to pay off as well in certain certain areas. So, um, Phil, are you asking, like, is it is it more likely that a company that's trying to sell into a value-based type of situation would have more success or more difficult um, than, than fee-for-service? Is that right? right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that we have enough data to really um, call that out, whether one is more successful than the other. They each have their challenges. Um, and I think the the value, and, and I can get back to you on some of the value-based care ones, um, but um, I think on, I think there's, there is greater longevity if you can figure out the value-based care model um, I think fee for service will eventually come to an end. It may be five years from now, it may be 10 years from now. Um, but, but the trend of moving towards value-based care and being able to operate in that ecosystem as a startup, uh, you know, profitably, I think is, is a admirable goal that I would, um, actually recommend people at least take a look at. And remember, you don't have to do both sim you know you don't have to do one you could start on fee for service if that's easier for you to generate revenue and then generate the, the real world evidence you need there to go over to value based care or to start serving value based care customers it's an it can be an and it doesn't need to be an or okay yeah makes sense And Marshall. Um, yeah, I'm curious. You said um, earlier that the you know the trend for younger people tends to be more uh, convenient episodic care. I'm curious how you see that interacting with your what are the statement you just made that you th you, see, you think value based uh, value based care will take over and fee for service will disappear. It seems like those are like a little bit in contrast. Like if young people want episodic fee based services, why do you see that transitioning out? 
Well, I just think the business model is there. I mean, uh, the 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 fee for service, um, the fee for service will um, probably continue uh, to some extent. But I think that when we look at value based care and we look at um, where the where the industry has to go, um, I think yes, the the younger people are going for their for their you know uh, they're going to the urgent care and everything. But those are well, it's fee for service. It's really inexpensive. So it's not like, you know, I'm, I'm going to go get, you know, a knee replaced. Um, so I and, and most of it is covered by, you know, if they're insured through their employers, it's co-pays and things like that. So I think that model is actually going to always survive. I'm thinking more in terms or terms of chronic care, um, you know, elective surgeries and all of that. I see. You mean like in terms of spin rather than maybe in terms of heads? Right. Okay, yeah. sure. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, just a quick time check. We've got about 13 minutes left um, in the in the session. Um, so if you wanted to cover anything else. Well, I was going to tell the story of Beekeeper through the startup program. Should I do that? Yep, definitely. Okay. So, um, and thanks everybody for the good comments. I always learn stuff when I talk to others um, that are in this space so so much and so deeply. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about the Microsoft for Startups program and then share with you um, a journey of one of the startups that, and you, you'll understand why I wanted it, why I picked them. But basically, you know, our program is designed to help early stage companies grow and scale, obviously on Microsoft technology open to all, no cost. We send out a bunch of credits and a lot of our tools to um, that you can use both to build your business and to build your solution. We have four levels and those are the four levels. The idea is that as you grow and you need different tools. So what you're thinking about at ID8 is different than when you've got an MVP and are ready to scale and, and prove product market fit. Um, $150,000 worth of cloud credits. We give you like Azure um, uh, access, including OpenAI and Azure OpenAI and all kinds of good stuff. Um, and then also some development tools like Visual Studio, GitHub Enterprise, and then a bunch of things uh, to run your business like uh, M365, which includes Office and Teams, uh, Dynamic CRM to run your sales cycles, LinkedIn, and a bunch of other stuff. We also have um, an expert network that you can log into, which has tons of Microsoft people from product teams to business development, to marketing, to industry specialists who have all agreed to take half hour calls from startups who want to talk to them and, and learn from them. Um, so that's a quick view into the program. Um, I'm gonna share that, I've already shared this deck with um, Dennis and Brett. So they have it at the back of this deck is a full details about this Microsoft for Startups program and what you get if it's of interest. But um, I want to talk a little bit about a company called Beekeeper. Um, they are an AI company focused on healthcare and life sciences. And I've been working with them actually for quite some time. They were a spin out of UCSF. And I met them when they were still part of that organization. And as required by Microsoft for Startups, we don't work with educational institutions. The startups have to be independent organizations. So once they spun out as Beekeeper, we started talking to them. They joined our Founders Hub program, which is our standard program. And then they were recruited for Pegasus, which is our top tier. We literally have tens of thousands of startups in our program across all industries and only about 150 in Pegasus. So while getting into Founders Hub, super easy, anyone can join, um, to be part of Pegasus is very difficult. We have 25 in health and life sciences. And so we recruited them for Pegasus. And within that program, we do deep technical engagement to make sure that their solution is optimized, scalable, and enterprise ready. And then we go and do a deep go to market program with them where we leverage our Microsoft enterprise community and network um, and bring them in side by side with us into those uh, customers. 
So these are some of the slides that Beekeeper shared with me to share with you. Um, they've got a really strong team, a couple of, uh, they've got a doctor and a PhD, um, serial founders out of UCSF. Um, and they started developing algorithms that they um, got cleared while they were still part of UCSF. Um, and one of the things that they're solving for is the fact that there's a ton of data that is out there that providers, pharmaceutical companies, med device companies want to be able to use to treat patients better, but also to improve what they do. And so, you know, this idea of, well, send us your data, you can't do that. You know, anonymizing data often changes the kind of the tone and tenor of the data. So that's not necessarily ideal either. So they decided that they would accelerate real world data collection and try to use that to improve health out outcomes by doing privacy protecting data um, management and intellectual property management. So what they have now is escrow AI, which is essentially a product that brings together data stewards and AI algorithm developers and enables them to work together while protecting the IP and protecting the data. They use, um, in this case, they use Azure Confidential Compute, which underneath that has like a blockchain type of ledger so that everything has an audit trail and everything is protected. So PHI and PII do not need to be anonymized. They stay intact, but the, um, the data can be used where it is. It's HIPAA compliant and none of the stuff moves. And so one of their um, big customer stories was helping uh, Novartis identify patients, um, uh, pediatric patients with a rare child. And so um, really great work here. And it was so great that when you, when we thought about the Microsoft ecosystem, and you know our hundreds of thousands of partners at Build last year. Satya Nadella included Beekeeper in their um, in his keynote address, which is you know part of our job on the Pegasus program is to promote these startups. And so when you promote them internally and externally, Satya talking about your startup, which was super cool. Um, we've also done a um, Microsoft customer story that sits on our customer story um, repository. So if you go to customers.microsoft.com, literally there are hundreds of thousands of case studies that you can sort and find, and you'll find this one from Beekeeper. There's also two, I think two from Panjaya Data as well, um, which I mentioned before. So this is the type of work that we do in the Pegasus program for these startups for high potential market makers and hopefully future unicorns. Um, and then here is a, another one where um, at Inspire Satya mentioned a bunch of our startups, including uh, Beekeeper, Integrate, Private AI and Snorkel AI. Then these are all, as you would imagine, data heavy with specific uses in healthcare and life sciences. So um, I've got some more I, you know, details about the program, but I can just stop here and um, answer any other questions or just not bore you to death the program in case if you want to learn more about the program, obviously um, the deck that I'm sharing will be shared with the, with the rest of you. Awesome. Some inspiring, uh, some growth there. Um, yeah. That is uh, pretty fantastic to, to be building one day and then have uh, Satya talking about your startup the next. So that's. I know. It was so cool. How do I stop? Sally, <laughs> Sally is, there, is there a way that if, if we had any questions or, you know, concerns or anything of that nature, because you, you seem fairly, uh, really um, educated about this stuff. I know you've been in this business for a long time, but. Is there a way that I guess that we could actually or reach out or to kind of get a little bit of information or, you know, for our like, especially for the ones that's starting, you know, just starting with our EHR systems? 
Sure. I mean, um, uh, my email, and I, I, if I could figure out where chat is, I, I, how do I stop sharing? Because I think I'm uh, locked up now. Oh, but, should we, uh, let's see. Because uh, uh, I, I don't that. see any of the, the toolbars, but my email is sally.frank at microsoft.com. So my, my only request is that you wait till after hymns which is next week. Don't <laughs> oh, email yeah, me before, before, the, before March 18th, please. <laughs> definitely. Okay, great. Thank you. That's, that's Sally, you should mention, if you will be at him, she has a book signing. On what day is it? Tuesday? You guys I should stop by and meet her I in think, person. Yeah, it's Tuesday. Tuesday, I think around 1.30, 2.30, something like that. Yep. Thank you, Carrie. Yep. Yeah, I'll, see, I'll be there with a book, front row. <laughs> All right. I trying to uh, do the the swap there to get it stopped sharing over there. Um, uh, thank you very much, Sally. That um, has was definitely a, a valuable look into um, you know a lot of the, the situations that startups uh, face and kind of their options for moving forward. Um, so definitely appreciate your, your time with us today. Uh, let's see. Um, I'd like to, it looks like she dropped off too. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll catch back up with, with Sally. Um, we only have a few minutes, but um, I am uh, interested to hear if anybody else would like to um, share anything about um, their, uh, what they're working on, um, any questions or concerns that you have, um, anything else that you'd like to talk about. Uh, Hope. Hi, thanks, Dennis. Um, so what we are working on right now, um, I work for the Rybar Group, and we're a healthcare finance consulting company. Um, and part of our revenue cycle department um, job is doing physician audits and education. Um, so utilization of AMA CPT is obviously um, a huge part there. And we actually are starting a new service line um, where we are going to be uh, or we are developing an education program uh, specifically for healthcare providers and then also um, a special um, branch for resident education. Uh, we found that there's kind of this uh, need for specific resident education uh, throughout the nation. So uh, we are um, licensing with CPT AMA to uh, utilize those e &M guidelines to uh, help further develop our education service line. So that's something that we're uh, really excited about. Great. And it sounds like that ties into um, Sally's comment about that the, the residents of today are, are thinking differently about healthcare. And so the education requirements are changing. Yeah, for sure. Very interesting. Um, okay, well, we're about out of time. Uh, so I did throw up uh, just a few uh, things up here. Um, you know, we're, we're definitely um, kind of listening into interoperability success stories, autonomous coding scenarios. Um, I don't know if people know, but um, the AMA also produces the guides to permanent impairment, kind of how, uh, how impairment ratings are assigned. Uh, and so um, we're curious about uh, innovation around that. Uh, and uh, we did have uh, some people at him at Vive, and um, I'll be at Hims uh, with with some others uh, next week as well. Uh, so always uh, look forward to to catching up with people uh, out at conferences and, and hearing how you're um, experiencing them. Uh, so please reach out uh, anytime with the thoughts, questions. Um, and Sally, I see you back. She's putting a few um, uh, pieces of information in the chat. Uh, if anybody would like to, to take a look at her email and the links that she's sharing. Um, thank you very much, Sally, for, for joining us today. Um, yeah. You've been extremely helpful. Uh, definitely appreciate your time. Uh, and I appreciate everybody else for joining today. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. Did I get the hook or, or was it a technical glitch? <laughs> <laughs> a technical glitch. I, yeah, I was in the middle of that and I said, oh, wait, I don't see Sally anymore. But <laughs> great to see you back. Yeah, well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for your time and attention. And um, yeah, anytime after uh, March 18th, you can give me a, 
uh, a message. Um, I also would love to connect on LinkedIn if um, if that suits you. And um, yeah, uh, all those links will help you kind of decide if um, the our program is suitable for you. And if not, that's fine. Do know that AWS and GCP also have similar programs. So I'm always very keen to make sure that people understand they should pick the technology platform that fits their company. Um, sometimes that's Microsoft, sometimes it isn't. Yep. Yeah, right. fantastic job in your book, breaking down kind of all the options available to founders. So I uh, definitely recommend uh, picking that up as well. To the crowd. Thank you. All right, everybody, thanks so much. Thank you so Thanks, much. Alec. We appreciate you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.